the Grand Canyon. One of America's most spectacular natural wonders. A canyon 18 miles across at its widest point, 277 miles long, and more than a mile deep. It is so vast that it can even be seen from space. Although Hell's Canyon in Idaho is almost half a mile deeper, and Australia's Caper T Valley is nearly a mile wider, the Grand Canyon remains the most famous of them all. And it also holds one of geology's greatest mysteries. Just how did the Colorado River, only a tenth the size of the Mississippi, form such a large canyon? The answer has eluded scientists for more than a century because many of the clues they normally rely on have been swept away by the river's water over millions of years, or buried by landslides, or destroyed by volcanoes. It seems like we should understand perfectly how the Grand Canyon formed. The problem is we've lost a tremendous amount of evidence. It's like a murder mystery where most of the evidence is lost. And so the best we can do is piece together the evidence that we have. Even so, slowly but surely, this geological icon is giving up its most ancient secrets. The canyon's richly colored layers offer scientists one of the most complete geological records on Earth. The first concept you have to get your mind around as you're thinking about the Grand Canyon is that the stories told by the rocks are exceedingly old, millions and billions of years. Karlstrom and his team are setting out on a grueling geology field trip along the Colorado River. It won't be an easy ride because this 1,450 mile long river packs a punch. More than 800 million gallons of water can flow down the Colorado every hour. More water every second than the average U.S. household uses in a year. Karlstrom is investigating the ancient history of the land that was here before the Grand Canyon even existed. And for that, he needs to identify its oldest rocks. He is following in the footsteps of pioneer explorer John Wesley Powell. In 1869, he was the first man to successfully ride the Colorado through the entire length of the canyon. All of us who work in the canyon as scientists admire John Wesley Powell immensely for his pioneer and scientific exploration of the Grand Canyon. And the questions that he framed are still questions that we work on today. One of Powell's discoveries was these intimidating black rocks at the very base of the canyon. Well, we're deep in the Grand Canyon, right by the Colorado River. You can see these spectacular black rocks. Actually, John Wesley Powell called them uh, ugly black rocks because for him, these hard rocks made bad rapids and that was harder on his trip. But for those of us who are interested in the early history of Grand Canyon, these rocks are the bonanza. Powell had no way of dating these rocks, now identified as Vishnu Schist. All he could conclude from their appearance was that they had once been molten, deep underground. But Karlstrom has an advantage. Modern instruments that can accurately date the rocks by measuring radioactive decay. And the first step in figuring out what happened here in the ancient past is to record when these rocks were created. These rocks are about 1.7 billion years old. It's less than half of the age of the Earth. So we have a great story here in the Grand Canyon of the last almost two billion years of Earth history. But Karlstrom needs more information. And these ugly black rocks hold another crucial clue to what this land looked like before the canyon was cut. They can tell him not only when they were formed, but also precisely how deep in the Earth's crust they were made. These tiny stones embedded throughout the ancient boulders are literally jewels. 
garnets that only form under immense pressure, the sort of pressure that's found when layers are crushed by the weight of millions of tons of rock on top of them. The silver bullet clue is the garnet. These garnets are the key to understanding the amount of rock above us. By analyzing the chemical structure of the garnet, in particular its calcium content, investigators can determine how much weight of rock was crushing down upon it at the moment it was made. In simple terms, if you analyze the garnet and you see higher calcium uh, content of the garnet, it means you're deeper into a mountain belt, more rocks above you. So we take these garnets back to the laboratory. We cut a very thin section. We put them under an electron microprobe. And the scientific result after this analysis is that we were six miles deep beneath the surface of the peaks, which were above us. And that's a long ways. <laughs> So, nearly two billion years ago, before the canyon evolved, ancient mountains six miles above sea level stood here, towering peaks as high as the modern Himalayas. Over the next 500 million years, these mountains were worn away by the relentless forces of erosion. Over millennia, the freezing and thawing of ice cracked open the rock of the mountain slopes. Wind and water carried the rock debris down towards the oceans, leaving behind a flat and featureless plain with no sign at all of a canyon. Geologists learned to visualize the way that this place looked in the past. Knowing how to read the texture of the rock, the kind of rock it is, the fossils that are in it, geologists can, it's like a detective story, you can uncover what this place looked like billions of years ago. This is now desert country, more than 300 miles inland. And yet, these shells, encased in solid rocks, are ocean fossils. In this one cliff, you can find fossil shells that look like you'd pick up on the seashore today. They die, they fall to the bottom of the seafloor, and they get trapped and die in the mud at the bottom of the ocean at the time that they're being deposited. Shells like these come from shallow tropical waters, an inland sea that first arrived here half a billion years ago and covered the flat, low-lying plain. But that did not happen just once. Many different layers in the walls of the Grand Canyon tell Karlstrom that over hundreds of millions of years, this land has been submerged by the sea, not just once, but at least eight times. The last time this part of Arizona was under the sea was around 80 million years ago. As we go higher in the layers in the Grand Canyon, we have different age seas, which are depositing different kinds of rocks, different environments, different fossils that live at the different times. This chapter of seas coming in and seas going out is itself hundreds of millions of years. Each sea deposited different types of material that hardened to become solid rock. Some sediment was sand that became buff-colored sandstone. Some was mud that hardened into darker shale, while the calcified remains of marine organisms were crushed into light-colored limestone. And yet, the dominant color is red. That comes from iron locked within all the rocks. Over millions of years, the iron rusts into a distinctive red hue. For the geology detectives, descending into the Grand Canyon is like traveling back in time. The calcium content inside garnet gemstones reveals that nearly two billion years ago, mountains the size of Mount Everest stood where the Grand Canyon is now. 
Sea fossils exposed in the cliffs show that as late as 500 million years ago, the land was the muddy bottom of an ancient inland sea. The next puzzle for geologists is uncovering which awesome forces transformed that unremarkable flat land into this breathtaking natural wonder of the world. It's surprising to go up a mile above sea level and you find a clamshell, or what looks like a clamshell, and you say, I, that's what I see when I go down to the ocean. So why is it here a mile above sea level? It's clear that this region underwent a type of geological disturbance that pushed up the entire seabed. Geologists discovered in the 1960s that collisions between separate plates of the Earth's crust could force land up into the air. It happens all over the globe and usually deforms the land into tilted mountain ranges. But this Arizona uplift was unique. After all the flat layers are deposited at sea level, there was a major uplift event called the Laramide orogeny, which lifted these rocks without tilting them, still flat, lifted them up to high elevation. Because the land rose straight up, like being in an elevator, it formed a high, smooth plateau. The sea that had been there drained back toward the northeast. But as of yet, there was no Grand Canyon. The Colorado River, the force that cut the canyon from the rock, had yet to arrive. Geologists from the very early days, from the late 1800s, are quite comfortable with the knowledge that the Colorado River has carved the Grand Canyon. The high plateau was surrounded by even higher mountain ranges. New rivers began flowing from the mountains out across the plateau. It's essential for the investigation to establish when the Colorado River in particular arrived, because only then could it begin to carve the canyon. Until a few decades ago, some investigators thought this ancient riverbed, called Hindu Canyon, provided the answer. They believed that Hindu Canyon's creation, 50 million years ago, marked the arrival of the Colorado River and the beginnings of the Grand Canyon. But in 1969, the discovery of these pebbles turned everything that geologists thought they knew about the canyon on its head. It turns out that to explain how the Grand Canyon got there is very much more complex than people thought. So the early geologists thought it was simple, but now we realize there's a lot more to the story, and it's kind of a detective story. You start out with a few clues, and you put the clues together, and then finally you get the satisfaction of saying, well, you know, I figured this out before anybody else did. Figuring it out before anyone else was just what Young did in 1969, when he was a 24-year-old geology graduate student at Washington University. His professors sent him to investigate Hindu Canyon. But when Young arrived at the dusty riverbed, he discovered that it had nothing to do with the Colorado or the Grand Canyon itself. His discovery flew in the face of all the established geological theories and revolutionized thinking about the canyon's history. The evidence Young had uncovered was the alignment of pebbles in the bed of the river. If you look at these pebbles, you can see that the, the pebbles are flowing, or the pebbles are oriented in this direction, which is a stable direction for water flowing to my right. If the pebbles had been oriented this way, the water would have flipped them over. So when we find pebbles that are oriented this way, that tells us that the water was flowing to my right. It is a crucial clue. The Colorado River could never have flowed to Young's right. It has always run in the opposite direction, towards the Pacific Ocean. The river here, 50 million years ago, was not the Colorado and it did not cut the Grand Canyon. Young's findings meant scientists had to rethink all their ideas about when the Colorado had arrived on the plateau. 
and about the age of the canyon. They started examining evidence from another, less ancient site. This is Muddy Creek near Lake Mead, Arizona, just a few miles downstream from where the Colorado River exits the Grand Canyon today. The underlying rocks prove that this was once the site of a vast freshwater lake. The upper part of the Muddy Creek Formation is this nice limestone which formed in a freshwater lake. Uh, the water would have been very clean. There would have been lots of plants and animals living in the water. And as they sank to the bottom, the calcium carbonate in their shells would form this limestone, which is typically what forms a limestone rock. The limestone is the calcified remains of the creatures that once lived in this lake. Then, 5.5 million years ago, the animals all disappeared. There were no shells to make fresh limestone. The only explanation is that the animals died 5.5 million years ago because that was the date when the Colorado River arrived here. The river would have been carrying masses of dirt and rock sediment from the fledgling Grand Canyon. The water would have been too muddy and dirty, and limestone does not form in dirty, silty, muddy water. It's just incompatible. The animals and plants that live in such a lake can't exist if there's a lot of silt and mud in the water. So the muddy death of the lake gave geologists a confirmed date for when the Colorado arrived in Arizona and commenced its excavations. The Grand Canyon was born a mere 5.5 million years ago. The investigation has reached a significant milestone. It has discovered the age of the canyon. <laughs>